Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build, the show dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Casey. I'm a former coder and agency owner. And I'm Varun, a better coder and an agency partner. Better? (laughs) Probably true. This show is sponsored by Galaxy. On a mission to help agencies grow. Okay, cool. Recording. Varun, what's up, dude? You ready to go? I am ready and fired up. All right, man. Well, the guest today, I am stoked. It's someone you've known for a long time. I met eons ago at one of his (laughs) famous camps. He is a speaker, a thought leader, a community creator, some say agitator of the owner camp, operations camp, design and leadership camp, women's leadership camp, owner camp XL. Are we getting the point here? He is the owner of the Bureau of Digital, Carl Smith. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I plan on agitating. Yeah, so let's do it. Let's be like a giant washing machine of all things digital right now and just agitate the hell out of everyone. What do you think? I think it's going to be great, but water and digital. Mm, we'll yeah, true. True. We'll have to cover ourselves in Teflon first. So, hey, I want to I want to pass you this thing. Start the show the way we start every show. This okay. thing is heavy, but I get the sense that you got this. Okay. Uh, here we go. Whoa. Grab that. You go ahead. You got that? Oh, two hands. That's nice and safe. There you go. Yeah, okay. Down the in the you middle. I got it. You got it? Okay. There you go. That's Thor's hammer. Okay. Take Thor's down hammer. Door. Smash for me some kind of myth bogus strategy misconception set the record straight once and for all boom there's work out there people stop saying you can't get projects you can't get work that nobody's hiring agencies that they're not hiring shops it's not true not true what what's going on are we are we kind of like you know the covid here is here and people don't have money is that we're thinking we're thinking there's no money anywhere well you know i'll I'll say that there was a time right late March, early April on into later in April where everybody was freaked out. Everybody stopped spending money. That was true. But, and then you had people, you, you fell into these camps of, we had the right industries. Our industry is not doing anything. So you had, like, if you were in higher ed, if you were in e-com, right? If you were uh, in government, there was huge increase in spending, right? Yeah. But if you were in tourism, if you were in travel, if you were in hospitality, if you were in events, hey, how are you? Um, everything fell apart. Like yeah. revenue dropped and then started going negative because people were canceling stuff. That happened early on and that, that's very valid. But then there were shops out there that said, okay, well, we're really good at this. Our current clients aren't needing us right now. Who does? Yeah. Who can we find? Some shops, even though they weren't going into the office, found really big clients in their cities, in their states, and reached out to them and said, hey, we're looking to keep going. Are you looking to keep going? Let's do stuff. And when you realize that there were so many companies that once they realized we have to keep working, Like they may have been looking for changes. They may have been, I mean, don't waste a perfectly good pandemic. I heard that gets said all the time. Right. And now a lot of the shops I know that made those early changes. The other thing is be flexible, right? Don't, don't hold on to rules that you've had forever. Don't hold, you know, there are a lot of shops that made moves to monthly payments to being more like a subscription. And when a client has the opportunity for an easier start, you know what? They say yes more. And if if everybody in that organization knows exactly what to expect, they're not going to get some big surprise. They know what the monthly is. They're going to go longer. They're going to go further. Yeah. So I, 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 go ahead, Vrin. Yeah. I, I, so I need to follow up on that because um, people have been always talking about specialization versus generalization. Right. So when you start going in that direction, be flexible, be open to do something different. Are you talking about doing something different while you are doing what you have been doing, where you're a specialist in? So you find like, because when you're a specialist, you are doing one thing for one type of audience, like Mm -hmm. for 
events, right? I mean, if someone yep. wants to work with events, they will continue to work with events. Now, how will they change? How will they adapt? Uh, you're not asking them to change their direction or specialization, right? Uh, how, how would you, like, what, what exactly is, you know, you're trying to say there? So if, if you did one thing for one group and that group stopped needing you, you get two choices. Go away or find somebody else who does need you or find a new way for that same audience that just can't use what you were doing or the way that you were doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. For example, there, there's, um, I'm not going to say any names cause I don't want to, I don't think I would betray any trust, but that's, that's like betraying trust and causing pain to people are two things I try to avoid. Um, but there was a shop in New York that was a little bit on the ropes and they started consulting with their clients on working remotely because it was something they had done for a long time. That had nothing to do with what they normally build. That had nothing to do with anything they did, but you know what, it helped them bridge the gap. And I think that was it. It was this thing of what are we great at? What are we willing to do? Not even necessarily what we love, follow our passion, but we need to get past this. So, and I think one of, one of the most interesting things, and this is true in the Bureau, specialists is what we want to be. Like you, you don't meet anybody that says, oh, I'm a generalist, right? Now there was a lot of stuff that came out of Google and Google Ventures. Um, and it was, uh, uh, I remember who it was later, but, um, but they came out and said, generalists are what everybody wants in individuals, but specialists are what they want out of organizations. And I think the interesting thing is, if you look at the most successful companies in the bureau community, they position themselves as specialists, but they're truly generalists, right? They just don't put everything in that portfolio. Like when you ask them about the services they offer, there'll be six or seven services. It's really hard to be a specialist if you're offering that many different things. So I think being a generalist who identifies as a specialist is like, it is truly the, the way that the most successful shops go because they know they need to stay focused on what they present, but they need to be accepting of work that they can do and want to do that comes in. Um, so, so just to your point, I, I don't think it's about shifting who you are. I think for that phase, it was about survival. Um, the, the shops who found, like, I, uh, I want to share who it is so bad, but they, but they found these really big companies that they never would have gone for. And they <laughs> just had afternoons with nothing to do. So they reached out to them, you know, they found somebody mm. who knew somebody, you know, that's the beauty of LinkedIn. If, if, if you truly know your connections, I, I know maybe a third of mine. Um, but, but because they did that, they were able to hold on to everybody in the company. Um, I think another thing that's really interesting right now, and I was mentioning this before we got started, I had dinner with David Poteet from New City last night, and um, he was coming through Jacksonville on the way to somewhere else. We were, we were properly distanced and all that. <laughs> you have to say that in 2020, right? <laughs> you really do. I've got this great shirt. It says, uh, United We Stand, Six Feet Apart. Um, yeah, right. But he was talking about um, higher ed. And how, you know, they had, they didn't have a banner year. They didn't have a bad year. They had a good year that nobody had to, they didn't have to let anybody go at New City, any of that stuff. But he wasn't just going to sit firm on higher ed because what's going to happen in 2021? Yeah, higher ed dusted off old plans for online learning. Like every university yeah. that said, well, we'll have to compete online. Ooh, that's University of Phoenix. We don't want to do that. And now they're like, oh crap. Like the students are going to have to learn from home and all we have is Zoom and heaven help you Microsoft Teams, right? And so, yeah. so now what happens in 2021 when Harvard decides maybe they'll loosen the requirements a little bit because this online money is kind of nice. What happens it to a nice. University of Florida that did not invest in the online stuff? I'm, I'm a graduate, so I can talk smack about my own, my own university, my alma mater there. Um, and now they're finding that they're competing globally, right? My right. kids can go to any university that they choose now and no university backed off their, uh, their tuition, right? The difference between being on campus and being online is like maybe $1,200 a semester. It's nothing, yeah. right? 
they're holding all that money. So what happens when somebody decides at the university level, we're going to lower tuition because we're not winning. And then is that going to start to snowball? So when you're, when you're a shop that's specializing in higher ed and you're going, Hey, this was a good year. If you're, if you're smart, like David, you're going, but well, next year. And if not, what are we going to do? Where are we going to expand? What are we going to take this time to do something with? And I think that that gets back to the whole, there are clients out there spending money. It may be your current client. You just have to change your approach. And on the flexibility thing, and, and then I swear I'll stop talking. On the flexibility thing, Varun, I think a lot of it wasn't so much what you did, but how you approached your client compensating you. Right? right? Hey, if you're willing to pay us six months in advance, we're willing to give you a 15% discount. Or if you're willing to pay us this amount monthly, we're, we're, we're willing to just keep working until you tell us that it's not a fit. Whatever you can do to take any angst off the table for that client, if they're mm-hmm. financially worried, don't give them a discount without some sort of a bigger incentive. Don't like just come off your rate, right? Or if they are um, you know, worried about a big number, you know, give them that smaller monthly. I saw this happen uh, at one of the earlier recessions too. And I saw shops that just succeeded because they went to monthly billing. They quit, they quit doing any kind of silly milestones or that kind of thing. They just went yeah. monthly, just simple, straightforward monthly bill. Yeah. And what like can we do, what can we do for you? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's funny. I, so the office I'm in right now is next door to the office I was in. And it's because my landlord is smart. Because I called him and I said, hey, our company lost 95% of its revenue in right. one week. It, it, I don't know that I can afford my, uh, my 100 square foot office anymore. You know, my $380 a month office um, that I've been in for like 10 years because I got teenage kids, right? And yeah. even when they were younger, it's like, daddy needs to go be quiet. I gotta, yeah, totally. I gotta go. So he said, okay, well, um, just move next door. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, it's, it's two rooms. It's twice as big. Um, and you don't have to pay me anything until you're able to. And I was like, what's my rent going to be? He goes, it'll be totally the same. He goes, look, everybody's moving out. You've been here for 10 years. Um, wow. that, that deserves something. So just go next door. Let me know what you need. And you know what? I kept paying him. I, I couldn't bring myself yeah. not to pay him the rent that he wasn't increasing, that he wasn't doing anything. And he just, and he told me, he said, you don't have to do this. I said, no, actually I do because I like to sleep at night. Yeah. And I would be taking advantage of you to have this now. And so I think it's the same thing. You go to those clients and you go, hey, I know what we were working on probably didn't work. And I know the goals that you had probably aren't the goals that you have now. We love working with you. We want to keep working with you. Tell us how we can fit in. Let, share with us what you're looking at. Let us, yeah. let us comment on it let us help out yeah because the humanity that this pandemic has brought where people are willing to just share more about who they are we brett yesterday on the dpm summit um he was introducing somebody and we weren't all the speakers you know it's like if something happens just make it funny don't worry about it blah 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 it's not a big deal um and brett's dog went crazy oh, just started geez. barking all over the place he was like i'm so sorry and he like turns it off and the chat lights up show us the dog show us the dog show us the dog show right. us the dog. that's what people want that's what they want so it's the same thing with clients like you just have to tell them we know that what we were doing isn't a fit anymore i don't want to have some awkward conversation about you signed a contract i yeah. want you to tell us what we can do now so so that's a great point on being flexible uh with your client with your existing client how you can change and um how can you make the relationship better in the current world? But I, I still like your one other point you mentioned earlier about generalist and specialist, where you're say, you said there are many successful companies in the community which are offering so many services, but still being selling or, or positioning the, themselves as a generalist, as a, as a specialist. Specialist, yeah. So for, because this is a very common question and people get confused so many times. Uh, I want and for our listeners too, what I want to get a little tactical here and to try to understand a little more uh, by having you answer like how 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 do you see that like how are they doing it are they going by industry are they going by type of 
work they would do only, but because services wise, they are offering design, strategy, design, development, everything, right? But the circles day, or the like, flow chart or the, yeah. It's building the same, like they're building digital products, right? But how do they become specialists in what way is, I yeah. guess, would be good to hear. So, so this is what I'll say. I don't think they realize they're generalists a lot of the time mm. until you show them what it, what it is that they're doing, what it is they're accepting. But, but what I'll say, and this is what we did when I was running my shop, was we didn't put online the company we were. We put online the company we wanted to be. And I used to tell the team all the time, the clients we have today are not the clients we necessarily want, but the clients mm -hmm. we have today are the clients that can get us closer to the clients we want. So we have to do the best work we can here. And when the client's happy, that's when the work starts because the next client we want, they're not gonna be happy with what this client's happy with. And we're not here to cash a check. We're here to do something. We're here to make something. Like the money's important, but that'll show up because money is a byproduct of awesome. So what we have to do is create awesome, you know? And, th and that to me was what we would put online. Like we had at one point, oh man, we were doing like six or eight sites a month and we were doing original illustration. We were killing ourselves. Um, and this was when we were coming out of the gate because we didn't have a portfolio. We had reputation because we'd come from other places, but after a while, our portfolio was so big and fat and you had to say what industry you wanted to kind of, we had to filter it down. Yeah. And I was finally like, you know what, we're going to go away for two days and we're going to talk about which of these projects we really like, and which ones we did, but we're not crazy about. And we're going to put three projects on the site and we're just going to see what happens. And you know what? We started getting more work in organic foods because we really liked it. We, we had done one project that was in fantasy sports, online sports games, and we started getting more of that because we didn't hide it in this mess of crap. But you know what? We were still doing the mess of crap because we still had to keep the lights on. So, so positioning yourself, I think, is very much setting that goal for the future where you're trying to get to. Don't lie. Don't do something you can't back up. Right. But at the same time, don't feel like you're just throwing a switch and you're not going to have to do that mom and pop restaurant site. Yeah. You know, you are going to have to do it. You just don't have to share it, you know, <laughs> still do great work. But, but I think that happens a lot. People say, this is who we are now. And then they stop doing the other work and then it hurts. And then they go back to the other work and they go, I want to sell my company. Yeah. You know, interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Position yourself as who you want to become versus who you are right now. Right. That's a great exactly. Point. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. And, and you know, you'll, you'll have diversity uh, consultants have shared this with me as well. Again, don't lie. Don't use stock images of people mm -hmm. who aren't part of your community. But when you have somebody that's part of your community that you want more people like that, make sure you highlight those people. We had um, at one mm -hmm. of our events, maybe three years ago, uh, we were in San Antonio and there was a young Muslim girl um, who was in, you know, wore her traditional clothes. And I remember we were talking to her and I said, hey, we're going to do some interviews and I would love to have an interview with you just about why you're here, how it's going, all this kind of stuff. And uh, would that be okay? And she goes, I'm a young 20s girl. I would love to be videoed. Are you kidding me? I, I, <laughs> let's do it, right? Do it. Um, and she said, is there anything I should or shouldn't say? I said, just things you want to say, say them and don't want to say, don't say them. You know, and so just being able to understand that it's the same thing, no matter who you are, if you have something you want, position it when you get it really strong. Again, don't lie, don't fake it because people will smell that. Um, but it's the same with work that you get. For me, I, I'm building community. So it's when I see certain people in the community that I really want to highlight and, and super support, I do that. Wow. Powerful stuff, man. You, you're you just like a walking soundboard of like the, all the best things. I, I don't know which, <laughs> I don't know what of that to clip for the promo because there's things you've said like money is a byproduct of awesome. And that's one of my favorite words, Awesome. Um, for a while, I was the chief awesome officer at my company. Um, nice. I just, I love it. So yeah, it, it, that the value you create, the awesome you provide, right? It's like the debt, the product that comes after that is you get paid for it. People are saying thank you. There's That's so many things want. going on there. Yeah, it, but you know, even to your original point about there is money out there. There are projects out there. I experienced the same thing. I had that initial drop off from COVID where people are like, 
what the hell is going on anyways. But then uh, it, for a lot, for us, a lot of it was the big projects like, you know, the rock climbing, jumping for that ledge, kind of like those big thousand hour projects, those like paused. Yeah. People weren't like, we're not sure if we got the big budget for that, but instead the little ones kept going. And mm -hmm. even your point, I love that you're like, maybe it's not what you do changes, but it's how you get paid for it or how you, how you maneuver and negotiate that. That's what we found. We found a lot of small deals were closing and I'd prefer a big one over 10 small ones, but you know what? It was a way to <laughs> be yeah. flexible at the time and, and keep having that income going on, going on and yeah. still being able to help people out. Yep. No, I think that's definitely it. And it's, it's a thing. Yeah. Is this the work I want to do? Maybe not. Yeah but do I want to be here tomorrow? Right. Definitely. And right. if you don't have a huge stack of cash to stand on and you're listening to somebody talking about this is what you do and what you don't do, as long as it's not ethical lines, um, you know, if you don't have the same context as them, you can't follow their advice. Yeah. You know, Rob Hart says all the time, your mileage may vary. And it's one of those things that I carry with me. You know, I've, I've got a little bracelet that they did with YMMV and it's like, this is so true. You can't just do what other people are doing. You have to look inside yourself, find what it is you want to do, find what it is you're able to do, and then find that that little mix right in the middle and just go forward and be honest and talk to people. For Christ's sake, so many people just stop talking. Yeah. yeah hide behind the hide done. behind the marketing, right? Stop talking <laughs> to the customers. They forget who they are. Yeah. Real I people. don't know. We're doing all the social. People just stop clicking on it. Oh, yeah. It's because we're all just yelling at each other on social. Oh my God. It's, such, really a, it's such a quagmire. I will say this. I know some social media companies. Um, we've got a few of them in, in the, in the space and you know, where they've gone is they're still doing the stuff they did. They're not getting the results they got, but they're starting to coach clients on things they can do that will drive more social, which is something they never did before. Interesting. Right. Because yeah. they wanted to own all of that. But now in order to, they, they, you know, we use the word consultant. That word has been battered, just battered around since the late nineties, which I think is hilarious. Yeah. Are you a consultant? Yeah. But I got some coding to do tonight. Oh. Right? So, so it's like for them to, they're truly becoming consultants. They're truly telling people how to start to manage stuff on their own. And, and, yeah. and people always say, well, if you, if you show them how to do it, then they won't need you anymore. Yeah, they will. Because they yeah, don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> they just feel like they have to. That's why workshops that teach people the way of a process. I mean, I could learn everything about how Elvis got on stage and gyrated his hips. That doesn't mean anybody's going to pay me a dollar to do it. Right. You know? Right. You know, especially if you show them everything they should be doing, because yeah, then they realize it's, too much. it's they're like, um, yeah, I remember first time I, I looked at someone on these like AdWords apps that's supposed to just it was great UI. So it looked like it was just going to magically like treat me like a kindergartner and my, my ad campaigns are just going to magically be optimized. I yeah. know yeah, because the, the app doesn't know if you wrote back copy. <laughs> it doesn't know if your ad targeting is sloppy. It doesn't know any of that. It just knows that you're not performing. Um, yeah. and, and sure enough, one of the guys, one of the solution engineers for the product was trying to teach us about it. And we ended up hiring him to do it for us moonlighting because we're like, okay, somebody needs to do use this app for us because we don't even know what you're talking about. It sounds great. Please just do it. You're right. Yep. And it, if he had held back and been like, Oh, you know, uh, it's a black box. It's mis mysterious. Maybe we would, or maybe we wouldn't have. But when he started yep. sharing that he knew everything, we felt confident that he would be the guy yep. to, to help us out with it. Yeah. I, I remember this advertising agency I worked at, it was, uh, and this is where I first learned. This was Melanie Husk was the one who said, when the client's happy with it, that's when the work starts. Yeah. Um, she got to this point where like her agency, Husk Jennings was seen as expensive. Mm. And uh, I remember as somebody who was, who was helping sell the work and, and manage clients saying, you know, if we lowered the cost a little, she goes, no. I go, what? She goes, I only want them to call us when it's too important. Like I want them to be at a table talking to each other and going, this is too important. We need to hire Husk for this. Yes. You know, and there were, there were other shops that would get all this work. And I'd be like, ah, oh. and she'd go, yeah, but we're going to get the good work. It's you know, true. and we did. <laughs> you know, because, and that was a different time. And, you know, every context, yeah. every situation is different. But I remember her saying, you know, I want them to say, this is too important. Let's hire Husk. I just thought that was amazing. I love that. It's like, it's like that whole nobody gets fired hiring IBM, having a, some kind of mental thing implanted in someone's brain around your brand. I mean, that's, that's gold. 
we went up against IBM once. I remember him walk, walking in, honest to God, in those blue suits right after we pitched. Oh, geez. And I just looked and I went, well, are you going to tell him nobody ever got fired for hiring you? And the guy said, yep. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> I was surprised he even need to say it, but I guess it just reaffirms that. I it mean, was just fun. They just they walk in. Was- yeah, they walk in and you just know that. We're in them. jeans and t-shirts and we're going, oh, well, this is not going to go well. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Do you want to trust your, um, your precious you know, <laughs> data center to the t-shirt guys or to these suits? Yeah. No, I'll tell you what, I don't know. But you know, it's, I just want to share this quote really quick. Cause yeah. I think this is another part of, of what everybody's going through in 2020. And this is Henry David Thoreau said this, he said, beware of any enterprise that requires a change of clothing. And, and you can take that literally Like if in order to succeed, you have to put on a tie. Okay, that's a change of clothing. But I think what he really meant was if you have to change the the fabric of who you are to accomplish something, then you've lost part of yourself. And that that quote has always gone with me ever since I first saw it. Like beware of any enterprise that requires a change of clothing. And if I find that I am going to present myself a different way if I am going to present the work we do a different way or something like I mean like I I said earlier I call myself general manager sometimes that's because it's easier for a hotel to understand I'm not trying to con them or do something else like that but uh, but that that quote to me just says so much about life and again it's in the context of who you are and what you have to do to survive and, and thrive and all of those things but never give part of yourself away I just I hope everybody listening takes that with them yeah I you know, the challenge I have for you on that is, you know, for the the brands that are starting to have those competitions with the IBMs, they're starting to, you know, they're punching above their weight class because they're good, you know, and they're not the Accenture, but they're trying to grow to be that. How, any advice for them when they're trying to, they're trying to play in that league, be that yeah. be a brand that can hang out in that league, but they don't want to lose that, their soul, you know, as they, as yeah. they transition. Double down on what you're different. Yeah. But what makes you different? We um, we were competing against uh, a huge shop out of New York at one point, and we had one of our uh, one of our team members was all tatted up, like he was sleeve tats, and um, we were going in to present, and this was this was government work, okay, right? And he said, "What should I wear?" I said, "Short sleeves, man." I was like, "I want them to know that we're not like the other three groups that came in the room." Yeah. And you know what? And we'll tell them. We're like, hey, if you want people that are reading books and figuring stuff out, or if you want people that are doing it, that's your choice. And the people that mm. are doing it look like us. So that's what you have to decide. And we won that project, right? Wow. I'm not saying we won it because he was like that. I think we won it because we weren't like the other groups. If you yeah. start trying to be like somebody who's, who is that, it's going to smell, right? Your jacket's not going to fit quite right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're going to know that. I know that feeling. We actually, uh, we were pitching... Um, the JM family in Jacksonville, which is this uh, huge, they, they all the Toyotas that come into the country come wow. in through JM family, right? Um, and we were driving there and the person I was going with realized that we were in an infinity. <laughs> oh. And he goes, I got to get a new car. And he literally stopped on the way and we bought a Toyota like as fast as we could. <laughs> We, we just told the guy, right? The guy's and lucky day, forget, right? He's like trying. We, we were like 30 minutes late to the meeting uh, for something we were going to park in a parking lot because he was worried and we didn't get that client. And I was like, that was the dumbest experience you know, he's got I've a ever car had in my life. With. Because you're worried that, that they're going to come out. Ugh. You know, I think in, sometimes in those cases, it, even just bringing up, well, there's a reason why I don't have a Toyota yet <laughs> yeah you know and because you're marketing and we're Let here to fix help that. fix that yeah <laughs> right yeah i don't Absolutely. but like i'm the litmus test i'm yeah. and i'm gonna convince other people that are like me to make that call in the future you know don't always don't always tell a client what's great about what they have sometimes show them the stuff they don't want to hear totally. we, we want a big seafood chain because um it's a cool story about me but hey this is my my episode of the yeah, podcast this is your Let's episode man um I, st- I stood out front of their restaurant with a little camcorder and interviewed people leaving, asking how their meals were. And like half of them said they were dog shit. <laughs> and so when we went to present the client, I showed them the videos of people saying that their food sucked. 
And I said, hey, you need to hire us, but first you got to fix the quality of your product. Like if you, if you bring us in to make promises you can't fulfill, you are wasting money. Take your media budget, take your marketing budget, fix your product, then call us. Yeah. And you know what? We heard from him like six months later, got the gig because everybody else was in there talking about how great it was. And they, they took the team there and they loved it. And we were like, y'all suck. We're sorry, but we can't fix suck. You know, there's just wow. nothing we can do. <laughs> Wow. I, I'm, I miss advertising. I do. Yeah, man. It's so much fun. Imagine I had a free reign to do what I wanted. The kind of team it takes to pick you over the people that are telling them that they're amazing. You know, yeah. that take that takes some leadership too, because the ones that I yeah. could easily see people just wanting to defend themselves and say, well, these guys yeah. agree with us. And then more yes men and yes women come in. But no, you're like yeah. that the counterculture, like, nope. And we never said it. We got their customers to say it. And I was like, yeah. I've got their names and phone numbers if you want to call them. Offer them a gift certificate for more stuff they don't want. Right. <laughs> like, what do you want to do? More of the uh, the cheddar twice-baked potato mm. <laughs> that goes with the, <laughs> the dry lobster shipped into Indiana. There you go. Um, man, yeah, interesting. Interesting. Uh, it, I mean, those stories are the best when you can just kind of – it's like a challenger sale, right? You're, you're not telling them – you're telling them exactly what they need to do and not just yeah. letting them talk. I like that. Like that stuff. Show hey, your authority and the, the, yeah, I was just saying that it confirms that you are the leader. You you know the how it has to be done the right way. If it is not set up properly, then no one can help them succeed, right? It has to be done in a certain way, and you yeah. are the expert here. So, that's and that was even before social media. Imagine mm -hmm. if they had this new campaign about how awesome everything was, and people sitting there got it, and it would yeah, it was that shriveled lobster, and they took photos and posted them. It's like the, the, the reality of having to fulfill the promise today is stronger than ever. And I think that that's true with everyone, right? There's, there's no Yelp for digital agencies. I guess you could say clutches in a way, although it seems like everybody's the top of something. Yeah. I feel like it's an Amazon top 10 list with clutch. Everybody's in the top five of something. And I'm sorry, Varun, <laughs> if, if you're number one in, in your space, because you deserve it, sir. It's the other people I'm talking about. Well, I will say this podcast is ranked. He's mad number, at me now. This podcast is number one for people with hosted by Varun and Casey. So, you there know, you clearly, go. yeah, probably number one in Moldova too. That's about it. <laughs> Shout out to Moldova. Um, hey, you know, you've used. I wanted to. I want to get this real quick. You've used the word shop agency. The, uh, there's a thing. I mean, I used to call my team i think we still do we, we call ourselves like an unagency what's your take on the the agency thing why do we play these games with the words and are they important or yeah. not so uh, this is this is a big divider in the community i would say it's a big divider in the industry yeah. um it's very polarizing so when you look at the origin of digital shops or well and let's say shops digital shops digital studios web shops like even digital was a weird word for a while no we're a web shop no we're web developers we're right so when you look at it these shops came from one of two places advertising agencies or software studios right the software they may have called themselves something else but i never heard of a software agency I never heard those two words put together. Now, when, when we spun up Engine Works, my shop, we came out of Husk Jennings, right? Um, Husk was smart, uh, but they weren't good at digital. They weren't good at web. That's why we kind of spun off, right? Um, and we never wanted the word agency because a lot of those shops that started in the late 90s, early 2000s, they were more project focused than relationship focused, right? That, yeah. If, agency of record no that was never a thing right what they what they wanted was the best work the best project the most exciting thing and at the time there was so much work it was even after the bubble burst like we started in 2003 and there was so much work because yellow pages are being replaced by the internet right so you just you're cranking through brochureware man you're just going right you're just doing all this stuff but you're doing the best you can you're doing great work um, the last thing you want is the relationship to hurt the work. That's right. the way so many of us felt when we started was we, we're, to, we're building the new frontier and we're not going to let a client tell us that a flash site needs to be accessible. 
right? It's like, because I was actually in that call with the, with the state of Florida and a, mm. an agency that had hired us to build this. And they said, well, we want it to be animated with Flash, but we want to make sure it's fully accessible. And I said, okay, well, then what you need is two different sites. <laughs> right. You can't because, because Flash is Teflon. Like you, you can't penetrate it. You, it's nothing is going to get in there. The sites won't be able to index it. They won't be able, you can't do it. And we were told on the call to stand down by the other agency. Mm. And I said, I said, look, and this was in front of the client. I was like, Let, let's have a call after, but there's no way you can do both for the budget that you have. I just want to make sure this is said and understood and the timeline is going to double. So you need to know that too. So either, either if it's time, if it's money, but if you're building two separate sites, you can't do this, right? right. So that was an agency experience. That's why that word gets a visceral reaction from me, right? Even though yeah. I say agency now. Now what happens is those shops keep going and then in like 2012, 2013, real people who went to business school start to understand there's an opportunity here. And they start to call themselves agencies because they didn't have that issue. This is my personal belief in the, in the way that, that it came about. Gotcha. Um, but anytime a, a, a independent web shop partnered with an agency, it went poorly because mm. the agency made promises, not understanding what was possible. And then they weren't going to pay more. And then the shop got screwed or the shop overcharged them and then disappeared. But the relationships were horrible. Um, now you get 2012, 2013, you get business people, people come in, you know, truly out of business school, hiring uh, people who didn't have that experience, right? Like mm -hmm. younger developers, younger designers, they call themselves an agency because that's what it felt like. Yeah. But consultants is the word that, uh, that gets me the most because unless you're truly just telling people how to do it and walking away, you're not a consultant, you know? Consultants rarely actually build the stuff. So, so that's always kind of a funny word to me. And I, I know a lot of people disagree with me and that's totally fine. But, um, but I think agency, uh, like there, there are shops in the bureau community that if I were to ever call them an agency, I would get a phone call. Hmm. Yeah. Who, who are those? You want to just throw some out there on the podcast, drum up some attention, you know, I'll tell you one, the I mean, Sparkbox without a doubt. Yeah. Sparkbox is 50 ish people now in Dayton, Ohio and in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And if Rob, if he does listen to this, which I don't know if he will or not, but if he heard me say, well, Sparkbox is a digital agency, he'd be like, no, we're not. I think they use the term studio, right? Gotcha. Well, kind of big for a studio, but you know what? Studio are people, they're, they're specialists, right? Back to that, Varun. They're, they're people who, who specialize in something. Yeah. When, you, when you have a shop, you're crafting something, you know? So they don't want to be an agency because that's just not how they see themselves. Well, so one more pointer on that is it backs to what you said earlier about your personal role. Like you, when you talk to the hotels, you talk, you, you call yourself a yep. general manager. So in the agency world also, I feel sometimes it, I mean, we have seen in, in our firm, right? We, yeah. we have used multiple terms. We have used dev shops. We have used technology consulting. We have, you know, called ourselves digital agencies. It depends on who your clients are. Like when we talk to an other digital or other creative agencies, we will call ourselves as a dev shop because we are, that's what we're it trying fits. to do. We, yeah. yeah, it fits, right? But if we go to an end client, then it would become more of a consulting firm because we are coming in to consult them to do certain things that way. Right. So it connects with, like it, it is, depending on who you're talking to, you need to position yourself that way at that moment. Yeah, so, I totally agree. I mean, and, that, and that's the thing, it's, I think those shops that started like we did in the in the early 2000s, late 90s, we were in it for us. Yeah. And there was so much work that kept coming in. We didn't need to worry about positioning ourselves in any way. Yeah. Right. We actually, uh, at one point, like our mantra was serious fun. Like we were serious about the work, but if, we, if it wasn't going to be fun, we weren't going to take it. And we used right. to tell clients that if, you're, if we don't like working with you, we're going to, we're not going to take the project. We couldn't do that today. There's way too much competition, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but to that same point, once you get to, to today, there are a lot of shops that are going to shift how they position. We would position more based on um, who we were going up against. If we were going up against an advertising agency and we knew that they were going to show three ideas, then we would sit down and show one. And we would say, look, if, if you have somebody sitting down here showing you three ideas, they obviously don't know what to do. 
right? They're asking you to make the decision on what's going to work for you. We do this. We've done over a hundred websites. How many have you done? How many have they done? We know what's going to work. We will also listen to you if there are things that are outside of your brand guidelines or stuff like that, fine. But we want you to succeed. So if you want to succeed, hire us, right? Yeah. Now, if we knew somebody was just going to show one, we would show three, right? Wow. And we would sit down and we would say, look, you know, you kind of have to decide, do you want to be safe or do you want to go for it? And so we're presenting you <laughs> these three ideas based on what you're ready to do. And if you're ready to go for it, that's always our recommendation. But you may find that based on the company you are, you kind of need to go in the middle, mm -hmm. right? And if somebody's sitting here telling you they know exactly what you need to do, well, they are not you. You are the only one that knows what you need to do and you need options so you can decide where you want to fit. And if any of those people are listening right now, they probably hate me, but it worked, right? It's like, yeah. you have to know who you're going up against. And so to your point, Varun, yeah, you know, you have to know and naming yourself, I don't think is as big of a deal today for shops that start. But I think if you started in at the kind of that beginning of the agency world of the, oh, now I did it at the beginning of the web shop world, like that late 90s, early 2000s, that old guard still holds on to it. And plus, I think at some point, size of the company also matters. Like, for example, there are many shops or agencies who are maybe 20, 25 people. They're all, so they would sometimes agency or, or, or you know, a shop. But as you go up, like 50 plus 200 people, then it is hard for them to become, you know, just right. and just a creative agency then they would be more like you know they would be like a consulting firm or a dev shop a bigger shop right? no, I, so I agree mm -hmm. that was another thing about those of us that, that were starting out then we never were going to get big yeah. right we can't control the quality of the product if we just start putting people you know in front of computers of course we did i mean i got up to about 40 at one point you know it, not that that's huge, but, but I think you're right. Like once you get to a certain point, like when you watch the nerdery go from five people to 500, yeah. Yeah, that's not a shop. Yeah. That's a series of shops down a city block. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's totally different. But I, I think it really is about when you came into it, you know, a lot, the origin story I hear the most is somebody was in a band and the band needed a website and they built the website and then they got a phone call from another band that needed a website and wanted to know who did that website and before long they quit the band and just started making websites <laughs> it's an origin story I hear again and again yeah, and yeah. again yeah. it's so funny it's the artist right it's it's the yeah. inner the inner theater geek. protecting so, the craft so yeah. my next question to you man is like who are you who are you how do you, you know so many things you like know all the things how do you know I these do. things? Can you take us back in time? Like little Carl days, where'd you grow up? What'd you want to be? Sure. Um, I actually grew up in the city I'm in right now, Jacksonville, nice. Florida. I'm a native Floridian. Um, the only other ones I know are my kids actually. Uh, but yeah, I grew up here in Jacksonville. Um, ended up becoming a theater kid. Uh, that was a big deal for me. I wasn't the best student. My brother and sister were both valedictorian in my high school. They were both Ivy League. My, my sister at Harvard, my brother at Columbia, and then on to Oxford. So I was like, eh, that looks exhausting. Um, yeah. And ended up getting a theater scholarship at UF. So did that for about a year. They were theater all wearing black. And Wait, hold the presses. Yeah. They have scholarships for theater? Oh, yeah, man. Damn, I missed out. You didn't know that? No. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to brag a little. Me and my friend Brian, state duet improv champs in 1985. Wow. I'm old. Was it but, like Kenny G um, and Dolly Parton? Did you guys sing to each other? Or how did that work? No, it was. Uh, so what we were presented with uh, for, the, for, for the improv that won was I was a person with sight and I had to explain to Brian, who was blind, what colors were. So, mm. so that was our and we had like three minutes to just go and uh yeah we we brought down the house man it was amazing man it was I amazing like i missed that i missed that that's cool i <laughs> love myself so fans. much today <laughs> but yeah so then i went to florida um theater they were all really bummed out and uf was the number one party school in america that year so i was like i'm out and i went over <laughs> to journalism they were partying over there and having fun and the web was not even a thing we were still on typewriters there was a computer wow. lab um yeah it was crazy and then i ended up getting into advertising um uh, from journalism 
I, I'm confident it was there was a girl involved that I followed in the advertising area or something and ended up there. Got a job with a, an agency here that I mentioned before, Hus Jennings. Uh, it's a mom and pop shop, uh, Gary and Melanie. Um, I interned there. I sure lettered my mom. My mom knew them. So, you know, I totally leveraged that privilege to get in there, yeah. uh, get an internship. And that internship, after I uh, went back to school, they had a layoff of 40% of the company because they got uh, shafted by Wellcraft Boats for a print job of like $300,000. And they had to go from a 60 person company down to like a 20. Jeez. Because like of the that. boat people? And they then, got taken out by the boat people. Yeah. They did. And, uh, and then I remember calling saying, Hey, I'm ready for that job. You offer me a job after my internship. And they were like, uh, yeah. About and so that. this was just yeah. the person at the front desk, Mary McDonald. Um, and I remember I told Mary, I was like, well, so nobody's there. And she was like, no, I said, could I just come work at one of the desks? Cause I'm living with my folks right now and I got to get out of here. Yeah. She was like, all right. So I started going in every day and just sitting at a desk and nobody knew that I didn't work there. <laughs> I started getting called into meetings. People knew me from before. And, uh, and three weeks into it, I was literally going there, working on resumes, trying to find jobs. That was what I was doing, but people thought I was working. Um, the owner of the company, Gary, came up to me and said, hey, we've got a big pitch with uh, Key West Tourism on Monday. Everybody's coming in over the weekend. Can you come in to help out? And I just remember looking at him going, I don't, I don't work here, dude. <laughs> he was like, what? I was like, yeah, I just didn't have anywhere to go. And I'm sorry you had to lay off, but there were all these empty desks. So I've just been coming in and, and working on my resume. And he walked away mad. And um, he was oh. the chairman. His wife was the president. She called me that night and offered me $16,700 to come to work. And uh, I worked there 14 years. No kidding. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I worked, hope you got I a raise there. at some point too. Oh, I did. I, okay. I will say I was well overcompensated gotcha. after a while because I was so confident I could do anything that I often tried. Man, I'm, I failed a bunch. Wh what but. a story! You just you're just like the guy sitting in a desk, and but that's cool that they like hi they hired you after that. Yeah, well, you know, it, I think it was one of those things. I, I would accept any meeting. I would uh, take any <laughs> tasks that was handed to me. You <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like. Okay, yeah, I'll proof this. Sure, I'll try Love to fix that, the man. printer. What do you want? Yeah, it was fun. And it was a great 14 years. I, it came to it, the, the conclusion when Melanie first asked me when I interned, she goes, what do you want to do? And I told her, I said, I just want to be indispensable. Yeah, I don't care. Put me wherever. And yeah. that, that was 20 year old Carl. And then uh, after I was there, 34 year old Carl, um, I remember I told her I was leaving. And she goes, you son of a bitch. And I was like, what? She goes, you did it. It took you a while, but you're indispensable. Of course, mm. I wasn't. she was indispensable. But I, I want to I share this one piece of advice um, from that time. When I started yeah. my own company, uh, I had started blaming Melanie for so many things. Mm. I blamed her for all these reasons why the company wasn't growing, why this was happening, that was happening. And uh, I remember at one point, she actually told me that what I didn't realize was um, she was married to her business partner. And she had to balance her marriage with her, her business. And I would never understand that. Um, and it was, she didn't say it quite so calmly. <laughs> like we, we were at each yeah. other a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, about six months after starting my own company, I called her and said, Hey, can we have dinner? And I remember the first thing I said to her at dinner was, I'm sorry. Uh, I had no idea what it was to be the person making all the decisions. And she's the one that looked at me and said, yeah, it's different when there's nobody left to blame. I yeah. accept your apology. And, uh, and it, it was great, you know, but, um, yeah, she sounds tough. <laughs> she was, but then, so I start my own company. Did she say, I uh, told you so after that or no, no, she okay. did once. I'll never forget. I, I screwed up a $2 million client. It was Comcast when they were just coming out when they were just buying everybody. Up. Was their customer service I, better back then or. I messed it up. I, it was all bad back then. <laughs> all, all cable television was bad back then. And, um, and it was before like, you know, the, the high speed stuff, well, they call yeah. it high speed, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say we wrote this great ad that said, uh, your friends are all having fun and you're just sitting there at this bar. And it was like a status bar loading. Nah. We were so proud of ourselves. <laughs> right? So proud. But, um, but once I was running my own shop, uh, you know, it, it gets lonely. Yeah. And, uh, you go to South by you, this or that. Um, there were two shops that we partnered with, uh, electric pulp and, um, uh, how am I forgetting include, right. These were two shops that just, 
we kind of met each other. We liked each other. And we all said that if anything ever happened to one of us where we were in trouble, I'd shoot up a flare and the other two would send work to that shop. So we had this like little quiet pact. Wow, like we were that's cool. Keep each other going. It was yeah. super cool. I was the only one that ever shot a flare and then I didn't need it. So, it, you know, I, I did, but they showed up. Wow. So that was really cool. Um, but the, the reason I bring that up is it was kind of that idea that, wow, you know, we can do more. And, uh, and so we started changing our work model. We started this idea of the Jellyfish Alliance where companies could work together. And that was when I got invited to go to the first owner camp, which was called Shop Talk. Okay. And uh, the Greggs contacted me and they basically said, we're getting about 25 owners together to meet in Portland um, to just share what's working and what's not working. And I replied back with two words. I'll never forget this. Why me? Okay, I don't get it. Like, well, you know, my imposter syndrome, if, if a white guy can have it, when you start looking at Happy Cog, like they were the shit. Like Jeffrey created web standards. I mean, it's like Happy Cog is the principal and they're calling me into the office. Like, what did I do? Right. And they wrote back. They wrote back. We've been reading your blog and you're either really smart or you're totally full of shit. And we <laughs> want to know which one. And I replied back, I would like to know as well. Um, I'll see you in Portland. And so that was the beginning of it. And so we're there with Kelly Goto, who wrote Web Redesign Workflow That Works. We're there with Christina Halverson, who coined the term content strategy. We're, and, and brain traffic was like still a great thing. Um, I don't think she'd written the book. Confab wasn't a thing yet. Um, Gabe Levine, the fuck you pay me lawyer, who's one of my best friends now. He was there. Uh, Mike and Erica from Mule. Yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah, like It was just this room of everybody. And I really had this feeling when we first sat down that the doors were going to lock. And Jeffrey was going to come up on a big screen like the Joker and Batman and go, ha, 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 and gas the room and kill all the competition. Right. Um, but what I found out going through those three days together was that we weren't wrong. Like what we were doing, I was always scared that, that the stuff I was making up was going to fail. And I also found out that other people weren't perfect, right? Like some of those shops had just had a layoff. Yeah. Other shops were having retention issues. I couldn't get rid of people. Um, you know, so it was like... We were able to share with each other, help with each other. And honestly, Gabe probably saved our ass two years in advance because I kept using the term permalancer and he pulled me aside about what the IRS wanted to do to me if they ever found me. Um, and so that, that like changed wow. the way that we worked and changed the way we, we treated people publicly as well as privately. Uh, just so many great things. But then um, I, my shop started running really well. Uh, I decided I was gonna take nine months off because we had created a self-sustaining, the jellyfish model right. worked and it was running. And uh, I just started going to all the bureau stuff. Like I was addicted to it. You yeah. know what? I'm going to go to the digital PM summit. I'm not a PM. I'm going to go to all these things. And uh, after a while, um, I decided to start a lead sharing network that conflicted with things that the Greggs were going to do with the bureau. They asked if I wanted to do it over there. Uh, I became a partner. Um, they both decided there were other things they wanted to do. And I honestly couldn't let the bureau stop. Um, this, the opportunity to help each other, to combine knowledge, um, to put egos to, aside. Occasionally there's a bad apple, whatever. It's like the majority of this community uh, just helps each other. And, uh, and that's what's beautiful to me. And, and so when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is look to see who's helping each other. It's beautiful, right? Varun, you saw it this morning, probably in the comments or yesterday, like somebody said, hey, I can't figure this out. And suddenly you get six people yeah. like sharing what they did. Um, to me, that's what I'm going to ride into the sunset, man. Like, I, I have no idea how long I'll keep going and people will keep wanting me to run it, but uh, it's, it's just beautiful. So I think ultimately that's how I got to here. And now it's about yeah. leaning into the community to find out where they want us to go. Um, because they've, I'll, I'll say this, at, at the end of, so we, we started a membership component in 2016 when I took over. 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, it did not grow because I never really pushed it. I didn't, I didn't want to ask people for more. I didn't want to do that kind of stuff. 2020, it has tripled. <laughs> really? And, and we've promoted it a little bit, but it was really because the community started putting out videos like Rob Har put out that video. And then you've got uh, Generations Beyond puts out a video talking about what the Bureau meant to them. And I'm just sitting there like, oh my God, what is happening? And then you start to see memberships go. And so to me, it's like, I am so in the right place right now. And um, I, I'm just, I'm just lucky as hell. That's amazing, yeah. man. 
you built something really awesome. I mean, I, I've been, as I said, I've been part of the community for four years and I love every moment of my time that I spent there uh, meeting and talking to people. It's thank great. you, Varun. I yeah, remember we first met in Atlanta, right? Uh, Atlanta, yes. You yes, were at Atlanta. Owner Summit. I remember coming yes. down the hall and seeing you and yes. going, Varun. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. So, and so I, I first, it's funny, it's a small world. I went to an Owner Summit and I'm trying to figure out how long ago it was because there's like old ancient emails. Um, <laughs> uh, 2016. Okay. Uh, you 2000... went to Camp or Summit? 26. You, you went to Camp, not the Summit, right? No, which, summit. which becomes our biggest marketing issue, right? Summits are big, camps are small. Um, was, if you went was... 2016, good God, where would that have been? Was that in Austin? I think it, oh no, see you in Atlanta. Or maybe that is it marketing for the uh, okay. I don't know. One of those we are losing in listeners as we go, Casey. Uh, that's that's fine. They'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll stick around, they'll, they'll stay here. We got them. You, we got we got them hooked with all your sage advice. Um, there you go. Maybe it was 16 or 17, but um, yeah, it was awesome. Who was speaking? It, like, what, what was the speaker that you remember? Not to put you on the hook, but that'll trigger it for me. See. See you. See your your database would be a better job of this than I would. But um, maybe it was actually fifteen. Actually, fifteen. Okay, twenty fifteen. Summit attendee. Bunch of emails showing up here. So <laughs> twenty fifteen. See, I'm I'm OG. I'm like old school, right? I'm like yeah, base man. camp messages yeah. from back in the day. But base camp. Sorry, right. Jason. Jason gets mad at me every time I promote Slack. I'll get well, an email from him. You I know, base camp can blow blah. I'm like, I sh shut it down. I love Slack. No one, you gotta, no you gotta, you gotta, gotta <laughs> but what's interesting is, um, Brute, who, who introduced us? Because I got reconnected with someone that I met a long time ago at owner summit. And then Peter, P Peter, Peter. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. what's his last name? I don't remember. Zach. I just know him as Peter. Like but anyways, Zach. he went to, and we had met and we remember drinking. I think it was Austin. Cause I remember roaming around getting great yeah. food and, and beer and um, we just hung out at Owner Summit and that he remembered me and he introduced me to Varun who needed some help and we started working together and now we bring you back in. So it's like this really full circle, man. Crazy circle. Yeah, yep, that's how you, that's how you do it. I got to figure out what's going on here. There we go. Reverse, reverse. Get it out of there. Reverse IP on the <laughs> at, uh, bangs on the bangs. Oh, man, I yeah, need man. a haircut so bad. Well, got a hypothetical uh, question for you. Sure, sure. Okay, so I may or may not have a time machine up in Nashville, New Hampshire here. And is it working? Can we, it, can well, we go it's back to 2008? It's covered with a tarp, and the squirrels have taken it over. But we clean it off after COVID. You know, we, you get it back to, you know, being able to be used. Okay. You get to use the time machine. Come visit. We'll hang, we'll hang out. Mm -hmm. you use this time machine, but it goes back into a particular time. It goes back to you after school you just graduate you're getting at your career maybe you're sitting in that office you don't work there yet you need to go <laughs> talk to that version of carl what would you tell yourself what kind of advice would you give yourself knowing all the things you've been through that's a great question um i would tell myself that that nothing matters as much as it feels like it does you know it's um don't put so much weight on yourself that everything you do has to be perfect and that you, you have to somehow hide away mistakes. Um, I think that the main thing I would say is a quote from Leslie Peters, uh, who was at one of our events. And she said, life is a quest. It's not a test. And I think that sums up everything I would, I would share with, with younger, very good looking Carl. I would, uh, I would just tell him, you know what? Just keep moving forward. Don't worry. Wow. And don't keep score. Don't worry. Don't keep score. Who you said, Leslie, who, who said that? Leslie Peters. Peters. Shout yeah. out to Leslie. That's, yeah, a, that's an a amazing, quest, not a test. Oh man. Yeah. I, it, it's my mantra now. Like I screwed up something yesterday at the DPM summit. Nobody cares. They're, they're in the chat having they're not, fun. They're not still tweeting about it. They're not but slacking I'm sitting, about it still. I'm sitting there going, uh, oh, stupid, stupid, stupid. You know what? And then I'll just say, life's a quest. It's not a test. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. I'm good. It's, it really resets me. That's, that's some powerful stuff right there. Life is a quest, not a test. There you go. Man. You doing any theater lately? 
Um, a little bit of online improv. So just with some friends. How mine. does that work? Tell me about this. So it, it's not any different than the three of us right here. Yeah. And we had no audience. That's cool. But we just wanted to get together and do something. Yeah. And so we did. And we're, we're actually playing around with doing it uh, like on a, a Friday afternoon and inviting people to come in. Yeah. So we'll see. But But let them just throw ideas at us in the chat and let us go for it. Because it is one of those things, and I had mentioned this to you earlier, uh, we saw Who's Line live in Vegas one year, and all of the people from Who's Line were hanging out at this bar later, and I saw them, and I kind of injected myself in the situation, <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was so hilarious, but improv is just, it's so important in every aspect of who you are, what you do, if it's a, if it's a tough conversation with a spouse or a, a kid, or if it's even sometimes, you know, talking to yourself, it's like letting yourself get out of one direction, only one way something can go and realize that if you think on your feet, if you start to look at things, different perspectives, if you stand up on the desk, like in Dead Poets Society and get that different vantage point, there's always good to find. There's always ways to move forward. And, uh, but you can't, you can't see that if you don't change how you look at it. Yeah, the whole forest from the trees thing. If you're if you're in the middle of it and you think there's one, you're you're not. It's like you're not in a tunnel going one way. It's a whole forest. You could go right, left, <laughs> at an angle. Yeah. Dig down. Let's dig into the dirt. Dig down. Let's see what's going on down there. Yeah. Climb that tree, man. Different vantage points. That's powerful stuff. What do you think, Varun? This is great. Yeah, man. This is, this is awesome. awesome. Carl, where can people connect with you? Where you want to reach out? Uh, well, you know, um, so if you want to connect with me, uh, LinkedIn is great. Um, Carl Smith, uh, type Carl Smith and Bureau or Carl Smith Jacksonville, I'll probably show up. Um, Twitter's fine. I'm still there. I try to, you know, avoid the fires as much yeah, as I right. can on Twitter, but I'm just Carl Smith on Twitter cool. with a C. Uh, I, I joined that long ago after I said it was the worst thing I'd ever seen for like a year and a half. I went, all right, fine. I'm in. Um, but yeah, they can find me there. And uh, okay. Smith, S-M-I-T-H at Bureau of Digital.com if they want to send me an email. It would have been first name, but I took over the joint. Okay. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But yeah, reach out. Uh, you know, the Bureau is for everybody and I'm willing to help no matter where you are. And I think Varun knows that. It's like, it might take me a day, but when I get back, I put thought into it. So I'm yeah. happy to help people. Yeah. And I would second that too. You know, not that I want to turn this into a sales episode <laughs> for you, but you know, why not, man? Because that's how we all met. So yeah. it's a, it's a great thing. And if people haven't checked it out, do you have anything coming up uh, that you want to put a shout out for in the next couple uh, of months? You know, um, I appreciate that. We're sold out for our next two camps. We do have an owner camp coming up in uh, December. Sold um, out. Have- how many people attend? Well, we've actually brought it down um, for the right. online events. We try to keep it around 15, but we don't yeah. want to go over 20. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. When we were in person, we would get up to about 30, uh, but it's just, it, it's a much better experience. And we also have a shorter time frame just to, to help fight the zoom fatigue and all that stuff. Totally. Uh, but we do have an owner camp coming up in December and I'm starting to work on owner summit. So we'll see. But what I would say is like, you know, just follow me or follow us on social. Um, yeah. Sign up for the newsletter. Get you know, that's the best way to, to stay in touch because also if things don't sell, we just cancel them now. We're like, eh, it's online. Right, right. It's not, like, <laughs> not like you owe Mary at like 30 grand or something, you know? Oh man. I will tell you this. Uh, it took a while, but we finally got all the deposits back. We had almost a hundred thousand dollars in deposits when oh, COVID crashed everything. And um, if you want to know who the good players in hospitality are and who the jack holes are, you just ask me. I'll tell yeah. you. Yeah. Ask you I'll privately. You is that what you're saying? Do you want to put it here? Do you want to have people ping you if they want to know? <laughs> they all paid me back. So uh, so okay. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dog them now. But it sounds like some some were more willing than others, it sounds like. Yeah, we, we had to get we had to get a little cheeky with uh with one organization. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Cheeky, it's a good way of putting it. <laughs> Take them to the mattresses. Exactly. Oh, man. Well, Dude, this has been awesome. Thank you. I'm glad. Thank on you. Here, hanging out with us. It's been fun. Yeah, I had a blast. I had a great time. And and again, everybody listening, if, if you're going through something in your shop, you know, somebody else has gone through it before. They're going through it now. 
get in touch. I'll help you find the right person to talk to. Yeah, man. Maybe as as uh, summit gets closer or something like that, we do we just kind of check back in and say hi and hang out. You know, it's an excuse to hang out, honestly. But then we'll we'll pitch the summit and you know have a good time. Yeah, that'd be great. Sweet, sweet. Well, cool. Thanks again, man. Um, Got it. This has been Agencies That Build. We'll catch you all next time. Have a good one, everyone. <laughs>